no one who's going to do PR for a politician is going to is going to uh, call up someone and say, "Would you like to be blinded or would you like your tongue cut off?" You know, which of those would you prefer? Uh, you know what I mean? That's what the difference is between a, a, a dilemma and a problem. A problem has a solution, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah. a dilemma, just whichever way you go politically, you have a whole bunch of people angry at you, and they're right because you're making things worse. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. What, what do you think the dilemma is that people that we're all avoiding? Um, the dilemma is that we have to make dramatically different changes in our everyday life and dramatically different capacities to handle sadness and grief and fear and uncertainty because this is a world where um, if you are any of those things you're considered um, weak mm -hmm. So um, I think that part of it is, you know, changing uh, an awareness of our, what's acceptable emotionally. Did you find that people were, did being with you sort of make people more free, do you think, to share from their feelings? What did you find? Well, I think always when you sit with a psychologist and they give you a little bit of space mm. and they mm. just wait and they're looking at you and they're really interested, they're listening to you, I think that people then feel the freedom to be able to talk from their heart. And so, uh, yeah, I think that happened a lot. And I think that what I did for a lot of, you know, what I call activists in, the mo in, the, in, the, uh, in this movement is I gave them a space to talk about things that they don't feel the freedom to be able to talk about with other people. Even within the movement itself? Oh, absolutely. Really? Yeah. Really. I think that um, one, of my, my, one of my contributors started uh, a place, uh, a website, that's private, and it's for uh, climate change and peak oil activists to write what they really think is going on. And she said, when you read that, it's a very different, and I haven't gotten there yet. I mean, that must be a psychological comment on me. But when you read that, you see that people are a lot more worried and scared and freaked out than they say in public because, again, there is this matrix out there that looks like everything is normal. Mm -hmm. And if you go too much against it, then you're considered a weirdo, a freak, and you'll be disregarded. You were, you were saying that folks, even in the transition movement, there's a split. Is that, did I hear you right? That there's sort of a. I, well, here, here's the thing. You have to, um, I think that there is some emphasis on wanting to attract a lot of people to the movement. Oh, and no. there's this fear no. that if you have, uh, well, like as some uh, person said, you know, I don't want to live in doom and gloom. And my thinking is, well, but you don't even want to stop by briefly as a tourist either. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't want to have any feeling that's have uh, anything about uh, the grief and the sadness. Because you're afraid that if you go there, then you'll just live there and you'll never be able to climb out. Yeah. And, I, and I think that that's part of the myth of this culture, that you don't want to grieve too deeply, even for the death of a, of a beloved spouse. You know, you don't want to feel yeah. too much because yeah. then you'll end up having an emotional reality that is so profound and so engulfing that you won't be able to function. I can, I can get that. When I was in the, in the um, late 70s, early 80s, when I took the S training, which you know, gives permission to feel what you're feeling, experience what you're experiencing, and I remember dropping down on a, into, into a, a level of grief, deep grief, and I, the sense of it was it's infinite, it goes on forever, I, won't, you know, I could drown here. And I remember that, that the gift at that point was to have other, at least one other person, another, you know, couple of other people, just sort of present, not actually do, doing anything, just, just 
being there. Yeah. And, and sort of like um, Ariadne's thread, sort of like a thread of somebody's consciousness. So I, I can get how we have so buried our, our grief, our tears, that we've, you know, there's this huge pot load of it. Yeah. And, and, and we don't know. I, th I think that fear of being overwhelmed about it until you've done it a few times and find out that you survive and you come out. I mean, that's the other side is I've come out of it, you know, feeling lighter. 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 And it's easier. Yeah. And, and I survived, you yeah. know, that sort of feeling. Yeah, people don't, I don't think people cry effectively, you know. I don't think, you know, when I'll say to them, and you had a good cry, and they'll say, yeah, I said, did it, does it feel good? You know, did mm. it feel good? Mm. And that's a foreign idea to people. Mm. That, the, that you can so get into your emotional expression and allow yourself to be the mammal that is crying and grieving and to really allow that to be a complete experience. And then, okay, you know, the, the Jewish tradition, um, which I learned, uh, it, you know, from experience is that when a family member dies, you know, you cover up the mirrors. You don't want to see yourself. Oh, you um, basically are attended to by people that are not in the family. They feed you. You sit there. You talk about the loved one. You go into it. You grieve and grieve and grieve. And there's a point where you think, I'm never going to stop crying. Mm -hmm. And then magically, around the seventh day or sixth day, you start to go, wow, oh, I don't think I have many more tears left. Mm. And then all of a sudden you're ready to go out into the world in a different way. Whereas if somebody tells you, you know, be happy or, oh, well, he, he's gone to a better place. Right. Uh, right. Or don't cry because it makes me un uncomfortable. And they don't use those a, words. Right, but that's, that's a lot of the message you get. Here, you know, some nice, you know, little, you know, happy face kind of response. And it deadens us, I think. Mm. I think that when you have to go and face the world where you really have no place for having that grief, it deadens you because you have to ignore that that part of you is alive. And so it's an as-if existence. Yeah. And so that's what I'm, I've been experiencing as I've been talking to people, activists, and I've been saying to them, what do you do with it? You know, you, what they you know where it's... You know where, what's happening. You know where it's going for you. Uh, you're aware. What do you do with it? And I think they have different answers, but they all boil down to, I have to compartmentalize it. Mm. I have to put it out there. I have to not go there, or else I won't be able to function. Yeah, OK. Um, and I think the other saddest thing that I've come across is when I have activists say to me, I'm tolerated in my own home. That I can't mm -hmm. talk about these issues with my family and my spouse. That's, I hear that a lot. And I, I don't know how somebody gets the emotional strength and energy to keep doing this work when they don't have a loving partner behind them saying, keep at it, keep doing it, you know? And, uh, and, and when I say that, when I say, that's tragic. I'm so sorry that that's the life that you're living right now. I often see them attempting to, oh, no, 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 you know, my wife, my husband is a wonderful woman, wonderful man. You know, it's really not like I'm painting it. They almost don't want to get in touch with the loss that they're feeling because then they would have to change something in their own personal life, which is just to unsettling. Yeah, we did a, I did a course with Carolyn Baker about navigating the collapse and several, it was a, by, you could tell of, tell of, tell of conference. Yeah. And so you couldn't see each other, which I missed because often the language that people express feelings isn't just with the words. But I could, I, several of them spoke about the pain for them of having a partner who didn't believe Peak oil, climate change, changing our lives. Well, let's make it simple. Real. Their partner didn't believe them. Maybe it isn't a matter of belief, because belief strikes me as being about the intellect. And instead, what they're not doing is maybe hearing, hearing their partners. Like I am, for example, for example, I am feeling really 
afraid, I'm yeah. feeling in pain, I'm scared for our kids, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. and we don't have practice, you know, that eye language, you know, yeah, saying, here's yeah. where I am. And that's actually what I actually encourage people to do. I had a, a woman a couple of nights ago come up and um, there was a 20-something a in the audience who stood up at, and question and answer and said, what do you say to people like me? I'm really angry. I'm angry I have no future. Mm. I'm angry mm. that I have mm. to um, really seriously consider and, and have rejected the idea of bringing a child into the world. You know, what do you say to people like me? And she came up afterward, this um, um, older woman, and said, what do I say to people like that to give them hope? And I say, you don't try to give them hope. You go and you say, when I heard you speak, this is the feelings that it brought out in me. So we're not, I mean, that's a very different response case. It's not trying to give answers. No. I think you make people even grimmer when you want to give them happy talk, when they're talking about mm. their sorrow. Mm. You end up making them feel like their sorrow is unacceptable in the real world, and so they have to pretend to feel something different. You told me a story about a woman that didn't want to, uh, who avoid, she wanted to avoid the doom and gloom thing, yeah, and, yeah. and her daughter, Tell me, tell me again about the, the, the daughter went to a counseling session and, and... Yeah, well, I mean, she, she was basically saying, I don't want to live in doom and gloom. And what was interesting was, and I think it's a defensive reaction, is that I'm only speaking on very surface ways about my tour and the things that I was looking at. And mm -hmm. immediately she jumped to, I don't want to live in doom and gloom. And the sense I got was that she didn't even want to visit as a part-time, you know, uh, stop, uh, a train stop. She didn't want to go there. Wow. And when I just kind of let her be with me, she talked about how she had gone to a counselor with her daughter, and her daughter was going through a lot of angry emotions and sad emotions. And the counselor said to the mother that she wasn't helping by insisting that the daughter be optimistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's really true, that the emphasis on insisting that somebody be, I mean, we have, you know, four to six emotions, right? We have happy or glad, we have sad, we have mad, and we have scared, right? Okay. And maybe right. we have emotions okay. like surprise or curiosity, you know, there's others depending on who you talk to. But if you can only be happy, and the question is, what do you do with those other emotions, you know? What do you do when you are feeling sad and you're around an organization that really emphasizes the importance of being positive? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or paradoxically, and this is I found really interesting, in one of the, the stops, they were saying to me that their group had frozen because they couldn't come up with a vision. And that for them, they felt that in, as part of their group, they had to have a vision of a future. And for them not to have a vision that they could all collectively agree on made them stop working together effectively. Interesting. And so yeah. one of the things that I said is, well, hmm. Hmm. W then why do you have, a, have to have a collective vision? And I, and I talked about the idea of a cognitive map and how in a survival situation, children that are under the age of six or seven who don't have that cognitive map actually do better in terms of functioning in, in the real world because when they're lost and they're hungry, they look for food. When they're tired, they look for a tree that they can climb into. But when they're older and when they're adults, they end up believing their map more than they do the world in front of them. So they'll do things like they'll think they're going north and the compass says they're going south, so they smash the compass. Or, you know, or they look at a, a, a pond and they look at a map and the map doesn't have the pond in it and they say, well, it must have formed this summer, you know, or spring. So they are so set on the vision, the image that they have of the world and where they are in it, that they stop accurately seeing what's really going on, which I think is a danger with positive visioning. Well, it, it strikes me then that they're dealing with how does what's going on fit my vision, and if it, does, if it doesn't, uh, we, we lose our ability to just sort of take up with what's here now or what has energy now. I mean, it strikes me that maybe we, maybe we turn to wanting to have 
a vision of the future, which I, I'm not, I don't know that anybody can have a real vision of how things are going to unfold. Right. I mean, because there's too many uncertainties, too many things we don't know. I mean, I like to say we're playing ball and running water, you know, that's the <laughs> name of a book, because we have to keep our feet really light, you know, because when the wave comes in, if we have our feet dug into the sand, we're going to be drowned by it. So we keep our feet very light, and at the same time, we have to throw the ball back and forth mm -hmm. to each other, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, we have to bob with what's coming. We have to change based on the current circumstances. So kind of the clue that, I, that, that I, if, if a group sort of freezes, it would say that, you know, my phrase is, is the, if the energy, is the energy moving? If the energy yeah, is moving yeah. in one's life or, or in a group, then, then it's going to take you somewhere. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so for a group to think they need to have to do a vision, I mean, that struck me as when I first learned of the transition um, steps that Rob Hopkins had. And one of the things that he had his students do early on at Kinsale was an energy descent plan for that town, you know, made from 20 years out, looking back, backcasting, looking right, back right, on it. Right. And, and I thought about that for our community and realized, well, some of that's good thinking, good Absolutely. exercise thinking about how do you use less energy and what do you do with your waste and stuff. Yeah. But I realized that that that's just all it can be, is a kind of a, of a good exercise to get people aware and thinking about the interconnections and stuff. But if you think that that's what you have to do in order to then do action, right. it can be... It can, overwhelming. It, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I was seeing when I was talking to people, is they felt deadened by it instead mm -hmm. of it bringing them to life. And it's very funny because some of the things that I was saying, it was shocking to them, you know? Like they said, well, you know, we have this agenda and most of the time we can't get through all the agenda and we work and then it, we run out of time and then we have to stop until the next week. And I said, well, then just give up the agenda. And they looked and said, what? You mean, what do you, give up the agenda? What, how would I do that? I said, well, you sit in a group and you say, who wants to talk about something? And you write it down on, briefly on a little list and you say, okay, Janae, you wanted to go. What do you have to say? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And it, whatever is immediately the most alive or time wise, you know, you might say, I really need to talk about this because we're planning it before we meet the next time and yeah. I need to have this and that kind of help. And so, that's the experience that I have, you know. I end up saying stuff and it seems radical. It seems, you know, out of the realm of possibility. Another one, they kept saying, well, we need to have a process yes. around this issue. But the thing is that people are getting stuck in the process, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I'm not big on process, you know. And they're like, wait a minute, you're a clinical psychologist. What do you mean you're not big on process? <laughs> And I said, you know, we have gotten so um, focused on the technicality of how we relate to other people that we haven't given the space for what I call the bozo factor. You know, we just have to be, accept the fact that we are, people are annoying, you know. Yeah. And when I say it to my audiences, you know, I, I say, well, not you, you're not annoying, but other people, right? <laughs> and other people are annoying, and they'll all raise their hand, you know. And I'll say the problem is not that people are annoying. The, pe the problem is that people think that they shouldn't, other people shouldn't be annoying. Oh. And so we have this expectation because of fossil fuel that we are going to relate to the people who we get along with. And if we don't get along with them or they're annoying, then we can just go 20 minutes out of town and find people that we do get along with. We can find designer churches with people who look like us and think yeah, like us yeah, and have the yeah, yeah. same religious philosophy than us. And that's not going to happen in a post-peak world. In a post-peak world, you're going to have to figure out how to get along with that guy next door who you've had a feud with for 10 years quietly, you know? You know, it just occurred to me that going back to what we were talking about, about people repressing, you know, pushing away or not knowing how to, how to express emotion, particularly the other three, you know, yeah. Yeah. angry and sad and scared. Well, it would seem to me that the folks that are aware of peak oil now and of climate change and that it's going to be changing everything, that the work they do to be able to have that kind of emotional honesty or to be skilled, maybe skilled is the right idea, skilled with, sh with how to share that, how to listen, yeah. maybe how to listen skillfully is the biggest one, may 
turn out to be one of the biggest factors that that help other people transition. I mean, I'm, I, re I realize that I and many others, the first thing we think of when we get scared, and when I first learned peak oil, is I wanted to jump into action, which right. was very American, right. you know. Let's do something about this. Right. And, and part of doing peak moment at all was for me to find out, well, how are other people? I mean, am, is, am I crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am Absolutely. I schizophrenic because ordinary life is going on and is yeah. this just, is yeah. this? The Matrix. Like the movie from The Matrix where, and people, you know, my contributors talk about that. They, they learn about peak oil in the privacy of their own home yeah. on the internet reading books and then they go out into the real world and like the movie The Matrix, everything seems normal. Yeah. And yeah. everything seems to be going on and you try and say, wait a minute, this is a fake world. And they look at you like, what's your problem? You yeah. Know, why yeah. are you yeah. acting so, like such a drag? You know, why are you focused on this stuff that's so unpleasant? And, uh, and I think that can be a real tax on the folks, especially when they think they have to have it, have a, have to have a, mo a positive enough story to be able to reach people. Because if they buy their own rhetoric about that happy story, then really what you're saying is, so you don't really have to change all that much. Mm, 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 and so when they see that not much change is really yeah. happening, the activists themselves feel more despairing. How do they, how do they then, how does one frame the story sort of honestly? I mean, I mean, if they're not going to do the happy story, yes, we can all just change a little and, you know, green energy will save us or whatever the equivalent is. Then how do they strike, how, how would you strike a balance between here's, this looks very bleak. I mean, yeah. how do you share yeah. that with people? Well, I, I mean, that's what the, what the lecture that I have been doing uh, is a slide presentation, really. Okay. And one of the things that I do in it is I tell the story of how people react emotionally when they learn about this stuff. Oh, good. Right. And so immediately I'm talking about feelings mm -hmm. just from the get-go, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm also doing it in such a way that people can laugh. And when you laugh, a laugh is a, is a defense mechanism, but it's a positive defense mechanism. It allows information that otherwise would be blocked out to get in yeah. and to sink yeah. in. Yeah. And then what I basically tell them is that it's not a problem that we're looking at. It's really a dilemma. And a, pro and a dilemma doesn't have an easy solution. No matter which way you go, you're going to face between a rock and a hard place. And as a result of that, they shouldn't be surprised that politicians are not taking them seriously okay. around it. Okay. And that politicians really can't, don't have the, the setup, if you will, to handle dilemmas because it makes them inherently unpopular. Sure. So, sure. so you can't look to them. Right. Right. And so what you have to do is look to what? Each other? Other people that get it? We're all, and that's where I emphasize the idea that other people are annoying. Other people are bozos just like mm -hmm. you. And you have to do your best not to try to be the superhero that the culture tries to paint you as, but also that we feel we are. I mean, I flew here, and I look out, and I'm in the air, and they take off the, uh, the seatbelt sign. I can walk around going some amazing speed, just like I'm on the ground. I mean, this is phenomenal, and I think it leaves us with this feeling like there's no limits. Well, well you and I have lived in a time in which basically there haven't been limits. And certainly in technology, it would seem to me that it would appear that Technology can solve it is one of the big beliefs sure. here um, because we've watched Men on the Moon and, yeah. and all kinds of other miraculous things. I mean, isn't that going to continue? I mean, that's sort yeah, of yeah, our prevailing, yeah, absolutely. prevailing belief. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the interesting uh, conversations that I had, I was at dinner. And um, so we're all sitting around and one of the women really wanted her husband to talk mm -hmm. and give me the solution mm -hmm. because oh. he had written a book. And so I sat there, not patiently, I will add, but I sat there politely mm -hmm. and said nothing. And he went on about his solution 
for probably 25 minutes. And you could see that the people around the room were starting to feel like, well, this is, this is great, you know? This will do so it. at the end, I said to him, so I, I'm curious, what do you think the chances are that the U.S. is going to actually institute the brilliant plan that you have laid out here for us? And he dodged it. And I went back again, dodged it, went back again, and finally he said, no chance. And I said, and how does it leave you feeling that here you've spent so many months or years writing this book, working out the details, mm -hmm. you know, he mm -hmm. was in graduate mm -hmm. school to be able to perfect this plan, and it literally has, from your own estimation, not from mine, no chance of actually being implemented. And he, he dodged, you know, mm -hmm. and earlier his wife said he was very depressed, this is what got him started on this book, got him started on the solution, because he felt depressed and yeah. hopeless. And since he began this book, he was now much more positive. Right. And it isn't my intention to be a downer, but I think reality is kind of good, because the only reason you really want to find out about this stuff, and I say this to people, is because if you knew you were going to lose your job in six months or a year, wouldn't you want to know ahead of time so that you could begin to conduct your life in a very different way than you're conducting it now?